Joshua, as a physician and as, as, as someone who thinks uh, deeply about issues of biology, um, how do you deal with death? Uh, what, what are the different philosophical ways we can um, consider death? I mean, death seems like a simple idea, but it, it is, has become much more complicated. Yeah, death ends up being a really pragmatically critical thing for physicians to understand. So on one hand, it is very simple. I mean, you know, if someone's rotting in a grave somewhere, they're dead. <laughs> if they're out and about walking, then, you know, they're, they're alive, right? These are very, very different states. And, and, you know, one is irreversible and one, you know, in, in, inevitable. And one is kind of a temporary state that we're kind of <laughs> heading towards that, right? But uh, the process of dying and when it becomes irreversible is really critical to understand because that really... Um, is determinative in the ethics of how we actually treat patients and actually how we can uh, treat that patient themselves and how we can even treat others. Let, let me give you some examples of this. Um, so, uh, so right now, you know, if there's a patient that's dying and their organs are, are you know, healthy enough to transplant, you know, at what point have they died and it's irreversible and it's actually ethically okay to then, you know, harvest the organs and take it to someone else. You don't, wouldn't want to take the organs from someone who's alive and has a chance of coming back. Um, you wouldn't also wait too long until they're actually rotting in a grave because at that point, you know, it's, it's too far. And so that, that's, an, that's a classic example of, of where determining what death is has just become really critical. And that's also where the definition of death has really changed dramatically because it turns out to be very dependent on technology, both in terms of our ability to bring people back uh, from a particular state away from death and also our ability to actually measure and define where a person is. So if you go back to the 80s and before then, one definition of death was just your heart stopping. And that's because the majority of people who had their heart stop really did that. end up in this like, inevitable path to dying. <laughs> Uh, they would go unconscious um, when they had a major heart attack, and, and then they would be gone in the vast majority of cases. Of course, medical science advanced dramatically to the point where, um, you know, you can have a heart attack, and uh, the most likely result probably is not immediate death. <laughs> I mean, of course, we're all going to die eventually, but, you're, you, you know, with modern medicine, it's to the point where that's not really a good marker of death anymore in quite the same way, right? Um, and so now, uh, one of the more important definitions, and you have to understand how technical the definition this is, is brain death. And the way how it's ascertained is there's a clinical definition where you can actually look at people's eyes and pupils, and it's very, but even though you're looking at things on the surface, they're based on a lot of neuroscience understanding, where you can also put um, electrodes on a person's head and look to see if they have any of the hallmarks of a functioning brain that, uh, that might actually be recoverable. And if not, you can be declared brain dead, even though the rest of your body is actually working. And you, you have a strong heart at that point. You know? Yeah, but this is a deeply non-intuitive thing because on the outward point of view, it just if for someone who's untrained, even if you are trained as a physician, it looks like a person that's just sleeping. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, a lot of the work we do is in assessing organs for transplantation. And the way, what happens in these cases, uh, I mean, this is an incredibly life-giving thing that that a person does and by saying that we're allowed to take their organs at this point that are living, you know, they're part of a living body, but a dead brain at this point, and take them and give them to another patient and it's, it's just transformative. It has such a huge positive impact on patients, but at the same token, they can be maintained um, in the state that looks nothing different than sleeping really, right? <laughs> for several days as their organs recover from the acute aspects of their, of their illness with a physician caring for them. But our, in all, all the outward senses, they seem, you know, that they're just sleeping, um, yet they're dead. It's kind of like this weird halfway place where the precision ends up being really important for the ethics. And it's so kinda, what are the characteristics of, uh, of brain death? Well, it's going to be changes in, um, in the brain waves of a person so that you know that, you know, there, there just isn't the activity you'd see in a normal brain. It's happening more and more commonly now because of the opiate crisis. So uh, when you die from an opiate overdose, it's because you stop breathing. Mm. The, the actual uh, opiates don't do that much damage at all to any of your organs, but you stop breathing. And if you stop breathing, then you stop having oxygen. And the first organ to so get irrecoverable damage is your brain. Mm -hmm. And so then, um, so then even if a person gets to you with Narcan and you kinda come, your, your body kind of comes back and you start breathing, uh, your brain may be at that point where it, you're just never going to wake up. And 
and it's a tragedy. Uh, that person, it really is dead. Um, now, of course, maybe medical technology can improve at some point. We could bring them back. Uh, but a lot of changes have happened at that point from anoxia or lack of oxygen that it's, it's not hard to, it, it, it's hard to even imagine precisely how that could be. Um, so we're, we can have pretty high certainty that, you know, they're not going to come back, but their entire body's alive, which is so not intuitive. And, and, and healthy. <laughs> and, and, and healthy. Well, it'll be immediately in that moment, not very healthy, but you give it some time yeah, yeah, yeah. and it'll recover. Uh, and so they'll be assigned to they'll be assigned a physician actually that'll take care of them, and and treat them as if they're in many ways just like a sleeping patient. But it's really to protect their organs to be able to transplant, and of course treated with incredible respect because this is still a living, it was a living human being, and it's still a human being that people cared about, care about still and love, and and there's a dignity that we want to even treat um, a dead human body. Yeah. Uh, How. Um precise is brain death because there are classic uh, brain waves that deal with very, very deep sleep. There are brain waves and an active brain wave actually has very small because it's, 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 it's a, there's no synchronization in, in, in an active brain. So it's very small electrical activity. It's not the big cycles that you see in, uh, in, in, in sleep waves. So is, is there a high confidence level that when, when that, is it like a flat line or is it a, di a different scenario, or just no electrical activity? What, what does a dead brain wave look like compared to uh, different st other stages? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, so there's two ways to approach that. One is almost like a philosophical approach, looking at how we correlate specific types of you know, images of what's going on in the brain with, you know, conscious people to see if we can get analogies. But then there's also an empirical approach where you can see if a person's brain looks like this, how likely are they to come back? Yeah. And, and so there's, uh, there's some variation. There's some variability. Not everyone's in the exact same sure. that's, uh, that's state, problem. right? And in some states, uh, we can be very, very confident there's really no way to be able to bring them back. Like if we don't see any brain waves at all, we can be fairly certain. And what does that mean, no brain waves? Does it mean that there's no electrical activity? There's just no electrical activity that's comparable at all to what you'd see in a, you know, in a, in a healthy human sleeping or awake, right? Um, and in, in that- Is there a period of time that has to go on for? Yeah, uh, there, there's, there's like standards and they're evolving. Um, and people are really carefully paying attention to this. Because like I said, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, patients uh, really, want, I mean, they're, they're people, they're humans. We call them patients, but they're, they're people, they're humans. They're, it could be any one of us as physicians, right? But we as physicians really want to do what's right. That's ethical in these places. Um, and, and to really honor, um, the decisions not to give organs or to give organs of, of patients and do it in a way that's going to really, really treat them with full dignity as people, even after they're dead. So I think that there is a, a really high motivation to get this right. And so there's, there's active study in how to do it in the right way. Mm. And it's something you really have to have a physician. It's not gonna be a nurse, it's gonna be a physician that's really deciding and making determination. Let's look at death in another way as a, a, a marker of, uh, of humanness. We're aware of death. Uh, it, it, how important is, is the awareness of death in what it means to be human? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so some people have even suggested that like the full awareness that we're all going to die and we're going to end is a uniquely human thing. Uh, that, that, that full awareness, that sentience. I mean, it's possible that maybe one or two other animals, like maybe elephants have this awareness too. They might be smart enough to, to figure this out. Um, they might be the only, uh, um, you know, only, only other animal that even has a sense of grandmothers too. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, killer whales as well. But, um, but for the most part, you know, there, there's something very uh, universal about death, and we're very early on aware of it and curious about it and, and know that it's going to strike us. And some people suggest that maybe that's one of the things that made it hard to become an evolved human, too, because, you know, if we're all aware of death, <laughs> maybe you just end up becoming really depressed uh, when people get that level of uh, sentience and then dying off as a species because, you know, it's not very adaptive. But then maybe what's going on with humans is that at the same time we have evolved the, the awareness of death, we also kind of evolved an ability to kind of deny that reality. <laughs> kind of limits if it's not true. Uh, so that, 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 that's a theory that's been kind of put out there which I think is a little bit entertaining. I mean, and then we don't really know that. What I can say, though, is that um, 
that a world without death would be a very different state of affairs than we currently have. Um, you, you can see it sometimes in science fiction. Uh, and uh, in Ultra Carbon, it talks about how de death is the ultimate uh, safeguard against the worst angels among us. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, there is incredible evil in the world, and, you know, with Hitler and, you know, other things like that, but at least we're not dealing with an immortal Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that there is a limitation to the extent of evil we see in the world because there is death and there's that connection between that. So, I mean, you can kind of think about it theologically too. Yeah. I think I, I'm comfortable with, um, I'm far more comfortable with a good God creating uh, temporary beings that are going to face death that aren't morally perfect. Far more comfortable with that than him creating immortal beings that are truly evil. <laughs> that, that's, that's, a lot harder, that's a lot harder to get my head around. Um, but yeah, it would be a very different state of affairs, wouldn't it, if we weren't facing death in the future? Mm. It would be, it would, it would be, I mean, it, w it wouldn't be quite the human experience that we that we have now. There'd be different value too that we that we place on one another and on different things too. There's something really valuable about human because we're not permanent. And that even if there is an afterlife, like our time here, is ephemeral, and that makes it important in important ways.